So welcome to the Agile Coaching Exchange. So great to see so many of you and lots of new faces as well as regular faces. Now, I am super excited about tonight because I remember back in 2008 when I was first getting into the Agile world and testing was completely new to me. And my friend to me, Mark Summers, he says, you need to read this book. And that was Agile Testing by Lisa Crispin and Janet Gregory. And ever since then, Janet and Lisa have always been my kind of like go to books whenever I'm recommending anything in that kind of like testing space. So when I was thinking about who can we bring to the ACE, we've never had anything around testing. And so sorry to be a fangirl here, but if you're going to have someone talk about testing, I'm pretty much going to want to have the best. And so I'm really honored tonight that Lisa has joined us um, all the way from Vermont in the USA. So it's probably pretty early for her right now. But without further ado, Lisa, I'm going to hand over to you. Take it away. Thank you so much, Helen. Thank you for the kind words. So I've, I'm experimenting with this new, relatively new feature of PowerPoint to have subtitles. So I hope those are not too distracting. But I really appreciate the invitation to your awesome group. And I'm really thrilled that it's people from all over the world. I wasn't expecting that. So that's really cool. We have great diversity here. And uh, again, I'm happy to anybody has questions, especially if I use some term you don't understand or I'm not making sense. Feel free to feel free to jump in. So a uh, little bit about me. Uh, Janet Gregory and I have been working on things together for more than 20 years now. Uh, and besides our books and our video course, we have a, a training company together. I've been working as a tester on Agile teams well from more than the past 20 years and been in the software business more than 40 years. And I'm now an independent consultant and trainer. Uh, so I tell, I, I say I'm semi-retired, but I'm having a lot of time to give back to the community, helping with open source projects and helping with conferences and things. So that's fun. And in my spare time, I play with my donkeys here on our farm in Vermont and uh, yeah, just enjoying the, enjoying nature. I, I welcome questions about the donkeys as well. So um, today I'm going to talk about a holistic approach to quality and testing. So it takes a lot of different perspectives. It, it, it requires a lot of diversity and involves the whole team. So what is quality? Uh, different people have asked me this and if you asked everybody in this call, what is quality, you get a different answer from everybody because it's really contextual and it's really personal. So let's say that we have an art exhibition. So different people viewing that art exhibition may judge different quality attributes. Are the paintings well executed? Do they like the colors? Uh, is the exhibit presented well? Did they hang the pictures at the right height? Um, are the frames of the pictures good? Is there a place to sit down? Is it wheelchair accessible? So if we don't talk about it, we don't know what other people are thinking. And we, if we don't talk to our customers, we certainly don't know what's valuable to them, and what's quality for them. So it's quite subjective. So we really need to have conversations to improve our quality work together. We need to work together to improve our quality. And Janet and I have found over the years that using visual thinking tools really helps facilitate and focus those conversations and get us experimenting and brainstorming and having good ideas to try. So I'm going to talk about some of those. So I'd like to just for you to just take a minute here and think about the teams you've worked with, the teams you work with now. Um, does the team talk about what quality means to them or to their customers? Do they talk about what level of quality they want and what that means? Uh, do they have specific quality goals? So I'm just gonna be quiet for a minute and let y'all think about that. And feel free to post in the chat if you wanna share any of those.
or I suppose you could just shout them out if people are able to talk. I don't know. Definition done. Yeah. Ooh, compliant. That's a really good point. Maybe imposed on you for somebody else. Automation. Yeah. Did our test pass? Uh, yeah. I'm not sure why we do this testing. Sometimes when you get in the heat of trying to deliver something, you don't have to feel, feel like you have time to even stop and think about it, but it is really important. <laughs> don't break stuff. Ah, feedback survey. Yeah, that's really, that's really good. So a lot of teams would use uh, net promoter scores based on their customer survey. So they'd have a goal. We want 80% of eight and above. Service level objectives, like, 99.999% availability. Those could be uh, quality goals. Some teams have a goal of zero defects escape into production. So yeah, and it depends on what we're building for whom and why exactly, exactly, Sebastian. So yeah, standards for being production ready. So there are a lot of aspects to this. So I'm gonna talk some more about those. So I first heard about internal and external quality back in probably 2000 from Kent Beck, who wrote the first book on extreme programming, Extreme Programming Explained. So internal quality is about how the team can have good quality process so that they can deliver a good quality product. So things like, you know, automated regression tests, not only do they provide a safety net so we don't break anything or we'll know right away if we break something, but they also provide living documentation of our system. Um, external quality is more business facing, what's important to our customers. And as Sebastian said, context matters. And both of these provide value to the business because without the internal quality, we're not gonna have the external quality. So process and product quality are, are really woven together. Yeah, and I, I find that, especially when I've been interviewing for a job and I ask some CTO, well, what does quality mean to you? Oh, we want the best possible quality. But when it comes to actually stopping and making an investment in that quality, they don't really understand what that's going to be and why it's really important and how it's going to pay off. So it's, it's really important to have these conversations. So if you've read any of Janet's and my books, you'll be familiar with the Agile Testing Quadrants. And Brian Merrick came up with these back in 2003, I think. Uh, and Janet and I have adapted them over the years. So the idea behind the quadrants is just to use them as a thinking tool, as a taxonomy. So when you're planning a new product or you're planning a new release or a new feature or even a story, what testing activities do we need to do to be confident to give that to our customers? So just a brief review for anybody that's not familiar. At the top, we have business facing. So that's that external quality. What's important to our business? What's important to our customers? And what tests uh, will make sure we have that value? And then on the bottom, we have technology facing. So that's more oriented towards our internal process to allow us to consistently deliver a high quality product without killing ourselves doing it or getting burned out. Um, on the left, we have the tests that guide development. So behavior driven development, um, acceptance test driven development, specification by example. These are all flavors of using business facing tests to guide development and the technology facing tests to, to guide development would be test driven development testing at the unit level and designing our code as we go by writing the test first and then writing the code to make that test pass um, on the right hand side we have critique the product so once we've written code does it really meet the needs does it do we deliver what our product owner expected is it going to provide value to our customers um, did we miss something? And so often as we're critiquing the product, we realize oh, we need to, some more stories and we need to some more changes. And especially in that bottom right quadrant, 
too often the business stakeholders just assume that we'll know and we as a delivery team will know uh, what kind of quality attributes are important like performance security accessibility installability there's a whole list of illities that you could go through and so often nobody thinks about that at the beginning and then you get to the end and you think you're ready to release but in fact uh, the page res the response time the load time is too slow or oh my gosh we have a big security hole it could be or or we didn't meet what our compliance people wanted we didn't even think about that so it's this is a tool to use as you're uh, planning the work you're going to do and we put examples in here but there's no there are no rules about it there's no particular place where things have to go it's what makes sense for your team So people ask, what is quality? They ask, also ask, what is testing? Uh, and these are some of the important things about testing to me of what it does. But what's really important to know is what testing doesn't do. Testing cannot assure quality. Q QA teams, quality assurance teams, cannot assure quality because they're not writing the code. Um, you can't test quality into a product. That's a maxim that's been around for decades. I'm not sure even who said it originally. Um, so we have to think about how are we going to build the quality in. People, the term QA is so pervasive. You know, 30 years ago, I used to try to tell people, don't use that term because you can't assure quality. But I finally can't fight it. But my friend Pete Whalen, he put on his business card QA for question asker. And we're really good question askers. So I like that a lot. Uh, and asking those questions is really important because we get need to get people thinking about all kinds of aspects of quality. And after Janet and I wrote our books on agile testing, people would ask us, well, how do you define agile testing? And um, well, that's a good question. And so we reached out to the community and asked people how would they define it and kind of tried to distill that into a definition, which is on our blog. I, I haven't put the whole definition here because it's kind of long, uh, but these are kind of the most important points of it. Uh, and, and to me, the most important thing, uh, and it's really our number one key success factor for agile testing is the whole team approach. The whole team has to take responsibility for quality and for the testing that they need to do to confirm that they have that quality or to build that quality in. So um, it's important, again, if your team should define quality and what kind of testing, what testing activities you will need to achieve that quality for every new change that you are building. Oh, thank you for that URL. I'm trying not to look at the chat because it's I'll get sidetracked, but it's hard not to. Um, now build quality in we have to really think of testing differently in waterfall testing was a phase i've worked on very successful waterfall teams i have nothing against waterfall if you don't need to del deliver more often than every six months as long as everybody still collaborates but even if you look if you google a devops loop and you see the loop that people put on the on the web they actually have a testing phase in the devops loop and it's like no 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 it's not a phase uh, Elizabeth Hendrickson is one of the first people that I heard say that it's not a phase, it's an activity that's part of software development, just as coding is part of it, design is part of it, architecture is part of it, operations is part of it, data management is part of it, and it happens all the way around that DevOps loop. So we really have to have a mindset shift to thinking about it as a holistic activity and one that focuses more on preventing bugs rather than finding bugs after we're done coding. So one aspect of this holistic approach to testing is getting everybody involved. Testers, product owners, business analysts, uh, programmers, everybody on the delivery team, operation specialists, site reliability engineers, data specialists, AI specialists, you know, machine learning specialists, they're whoever is involved in delivering that product, 
they need to work together. We have all these dependencies, especially those of you who are working on, you know, big, complicated microservices architecture, cloud-based applications. There's just so much complexity. Uh, you've got to work together and manage those dependencies. So we want a fully cross-functional team working together to produce the product. And, and again, they're probably in a co collaborating with other cross-functional teams. So it's really important to get everyone involved. Somehow I can't advance my slides right now. So this is the holistic testing model that Janet actually came up with last year. Um, and she, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Those of you familiar with that DevOps loop with the testing phase. Dan Ashby, a few years ago, did a blog post uh, where he had the DevOps loop and he wrote, we test here, we test here, we test here. So all the way around the loop, we test. And he called it the continuous testing loop or the continuous testing model. Unfortunately, the term continuous testing got co-opted to mean, oh, that's just the automated regression tests that run in our continuous integration, which makes me a little crazy. Those are important, but they're not the only thing. Uh, so Janet thought about it and also the word agile. I mean, I know you're an agile coach exchange. Agile has been misused as a label and it's kind of lost its meaning a bit. Oh, thank you for getting that Dan's link. I should have put it in myself. Um, so Janet came up with the word holistic. It's like nobody's branded it yet. <laughs> it just means everybody gets involved and we test all the way around that whole software development life cycle. You know, so we start a typical loop starts at a discover phase, a stage, I don't want to use the word phase. Um, what do we want to build? Let's plan it. Let's make sure we understand it, break those features down into stories, um, write the test that will guide our development, build it, deploy it. Now we can do some testing. Uh, we can feel confident to release it to our customers. And then we can learn. We're still testing activities, observability. What are our customers doing? What problems are they having? And what can we take from that information, from our analytics, from our monitoring, from observability tools to, to the feedback into the left side of that cycle? And it doesn't show on this illustration, but Janet has put pauses in between each stage and there's no set time to spend in each stage. And you might go back uh, and iterate through stages multiple times. Maybe you get to the build stage and realize, oops, we left something out or we didn't understand something right and you're gonna go back and go through that stage again. Um, so I'm gonna go a, a little more detail on this, but um, you know, when we think of the list, ho, testing from this holistic viewpoint, we realize how many different kinds of testing there, there are. Uh, there's no beginning, there's no end, we never, we're never done. Um, and you know, sometimes a stage might go quickly and sometimes it may take a while. But the idea is we think about this and it really helps us put together a testing strategy that works for our team to build that quality into our product that we want. So, um, so the first testing that we do in the discovery stage, that's led by the business people, they're bringing us new feature ideas and we can help them uh, determine if that idea has value and we can maybe give them the feedback that that's a great idea. It's going to be very expensive to build that. Are you okay with that? Uh, does it make sense from a business perspective? Does it fit our organization's vision? Um, and that can mean a lot of competing priorities and, and things like that. So that helps us. That's a, where we sort those out. Um, and as we get into the planning stage, collaborative visual techniques that help help us think outside the box that help us brainstorm about things like risks um, impact mapping story mapping those are some of my favorite uh, visual collaboration tools so testing happens early and this is often where testers add a lot of value because we have the critical thinking skills of course other people on the team do too asking those what if questions um, facilitating a risk storming exercise um, 
thinking about unknowns and how can we how can we reveal those unknowns uh, breaking down stories so that they're testable operable uh, all those good things um, so you know if our product is an application to help put together art exhibitions we might ask um, is the artwork already framed what are the accessibility concerns um, what are the smallest what is the amount of wall space available um, how will we mark window and door frames so we know not to hang a picture there? What kind of seating is required? What kind of accessibility is required? So we would ask a lot of questions about that. And this is the time to do that. We're working, we're focused here on preventing bugs. Mind mapping, story mapping, flow diagrams, context diagrams, all of those are really helpful in this, um, in this stage. Yeah, tester thinks, how can I break this exactly? So once we've got that sort of high level understanding, we've broken our feature into stories. Now we want to understand them more in depth before we get started writing code. So this is where we use our acceptance driven development, behavior driven development. We want to flesh out those hidden assumptions. We're going to keep asking questions and um, we're going to want to involve the domain experts, uh, the, the programmers maybe the site reliability engineers to help us know what instrumentation or telemetry should we build into that code so that we can have appropriate dashboards and alerts and things in production in case we have problems um, so these examples we give for each stage they're just examples there's not room to put all the things you might do there uh, you might be thinking about test data um, lots of lots of different things again before we've even written a line of production code we can do all these things and and it really is a great way to prevent defects especially doing it in a collaborative way pairing ensembling working in a group so now we're ready to build we're ready to write some code practices like test driven development are very important so we have good testable operable maintainable code writing a little unit test and writing the code to make that test pass and building it up block by block. Um, unfortunately, TDD has not been widely adopted, even though it's been around a really long time now. And even though it's been shown to prevent 80% of the bugs that people who don't do TDD have. But we're humans, we don't necessarily pay attention to facts and logic. So there you go. It's hard to learn. Maybe that's why. But there are lots of ways to collaborate. Um, you know, as a tester, just asking a, a programmer, hey, before you before you commit that code for that new story, will you spend 10 minutes showing it to me and we can go through it together, maybe doing a little exploratory testing at the story level. Uh, maybe maybe I can help, we can pair on the test automation because I'm a tester, I'm really good at designing and specifying tests and you're really good at writing production code, so better, better together. So lots of different activities can happen during this uh, stage. Yeah, show me. Some people call that desk checking. Janet used to use, I think she used to bribe the developers with chocolate <laughs> to get her to involve her. But it's a great way to build relationships as well. So now we're we've built something, we've made an artifact, we can deploy to a development environment or test environment. Um, and now we can do testing higher than the story level. We're testing more at the feature level. And we Janet separated the deploy stage out because there's so it's so important to have a strong deployment pipeline and she really wanted to emphasize that. Um, and a lot of the testing we do here would be automated, but we may do human centric testing like security, accessibility. There's just so many testing activities to do. And this is an opportunity to test them more like the customers we use them in a more production like environment. Also, we are able to test some quality attributes like load, performance testing, stability, recoverability, all those, all the things. This is where we can do that. And then when we feel confident, we can release to production. So we may even deploy to production, but we may use a release strategy like feature flags, blue green deploys, canary releases to hide those new changes from customers until we feel confident to flip the switch and actually release it. So these things all help us build confidence to turn to turn them on for customers. And 
and so now our features are in production, our customers are hopefully using them. Maybe, maybe they aren't. And so we can use our analytics tools, observability tools like Honeycomb and LightStep if we use open telemetry to instrument our code to do that. Um, using monitoring dashboards, all kinds of things we can do to try to detect problems before the customer see them so we can respond to them quickly. And if we have that solid deployment pipeline, we, we can get a fix and respond quickly or perhaps roll it back depending on our release strategy, turn the feature flag off, uh, revert the blue green deploy, lots of ways to do that. Um, and you know, how are our customers using the product? I'm sure like a lot of you, I've had the experience where we worked really hard on a new feature that we thought our customers would love only to find using our analytics tool of, oh, they navigated to the page, they looked around and they navigated off the page. So then we, we've learned something and is it just that that feature isn't valuable or perhaps we didn't make it uh, intuitive enough how to use it? Um, so we can try some new experiments. Yes. I've got a question, Lisa, and it's also a question to the rest of the group, because I'm loving what you're saying here that we should use tools such as Honeycomb and the other one that you listed to be able to get feedback. Mm -hmm. But in reality, I find in a lot of organizations, all of that kind of like data is often not available to the teams that are actually doing the testing. And so it's like a real missing loop. So I'm interested in how much of that do you see? And do the people in this room have access to that type of stuff to be able to give feedback about the stuff that they're doing in the live environment? Well, that's a good, really good question. And that's where that sort of DevOps culture comes in. So the idea behind DevOps is that we, we do work together. So the operations specialists that have all that access to the data are integrated in with the feature teams to help us be able to look at that data and to know how to instrument our code to get the necessary data out there. So what I, I've been lucky to work on teams with a really healthy DevOps culture where we had platform engineering teams and then site reliability engineers from, and platform engineers from those teams were embedded into our feature teams and helping us with our infrastructure and helping us with our uh, monitoring and observability and teaching us how to do it ourselves so that we have some autonomy because the, the idea behind DevOps is for the feature team or the development team, you build it, you run it. So you don't just throw things off. This is why, this is the problem that DevOps tries to fix. We used to throw things over the wall to operations when we're ready to release and move on to the next feature we're going to develop. Well, we didn't pay any more attention to operations. And maybe a lot of companies even have a separate maintain, maintaining team that deals with all the bug fixes. So the programmers who introduce those bugs to have no feedback that they screwed up. Uh, they do not feel that customer pain directly. And so it's really important for the team to care and for and nurture that those features in production and have that more direct access to customer problems because they're they're the ones getting woken up in the middle of the night and fixing them. If you don't have that right now, my advice would be start building relationships, make friends with somebody in operations or the platform team. And my last job, for example, when I started, I asked the managers of the platform teams like, hey, could I have a, a 30 minute one on one with you? And then once we talked, I was like, hey, could we do this every couple of weeks? And they were totally happy to help. Or a lot of times it's something like, I don't understand our deployment pipeline. Could you come and draw the deployment pipeline for our team or for our for us testers? Because asking for help is a great way to build relationships. Uh, Katrina Cloakey has a wonderful book called A Practical Guide to Testing and DevOps. And it's available on LeanPub. And a huge section of that book is devoted to how do you build these relationships since it's so important. You need to get those people on your side and, and helping you. Does that help? Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Okay, so um, yeah. So if something unexpected happens in production, can we diagnose it without having to add more telemetry to our code and redeploying to production. How many people's teams had to do that? I know I've been on teams where it's like, okay, we're getting a 500 error. We have no idea why, so let's add some more logging and redeploy. Ah. Um, 
So that, that's a goal. So just summing this up, this holistic testing model, um, the left side is all about preventing defects. The right side is about observing, we're gonna find defects for sure, unless we've really, we're really a high performing team that's really achieved this ability for zero defects. I know teams like that, but they're not so common. Uh, but what, the important thing is we find the defects, we can fix them as quickly as possible and minimize the customer pain. Slower feedback on that right side is more expensive, but if we do have the right telemetry and the right tools to observe that log, log data and the right infrastructure to deploy fixes or roll back changes, we can respond quickly to problems. So whatever your role, especially, and I'm assuming that at least many of you here are coaches, you can collaborate and contribute in any stage. And, you know, for example, a, a coach or a product owner or anybody can learn to use the analytic tools, the observability tools, so that they can see how customers are using the product. Um, everybody can get involved with designing experiments like, oh, we see this issue in production. What change can we make that might help resolve that issue? Uh, everybody can get involved in that. Everybody's going to have thoughts. That diversity of viewpoints is so important when you're brainstorming and experimenting. Um, the testers can collaborate with the developers, with the site reliability engineers, so that they can start using that production data. And because we know our test environments usually don't look like production, we know we can't test everything, collaborate with our platform engineers to understand, well, how can we safely do some testing in production? Maybe we can hide things with feature flags. You know, just if we're going to do testing in production, we need to be able to do that safely. So again, these relationships are super, super important. And the model is just to help you think about those things. And like I say, just build your strategy. Ah, so how do we measure quality? Uh, this is a graph from Isabel Evans, and she did a talk. Uh, I don't know if y'all are familiar with her. She's in England. Um, there were two different products with basically the same functional features, but they were aimed at a completely different audience of users. So one set was kind of tech, not tech savvy. They were afraid of breaking things. Uh, so they didn't care about speed. They just wanted something simple uh, that they could trust. The other team wanted to be able to complete tests quickly and they wanted a lot of flexibility. So there was no price point difference just the quality attributes in each product were different. So there were competitors in a way, but they had completely different customer bases. So not really competitors. So it was based on value, user-based quality metrics for individual personas. They're both providing value for the users they're targeting. So in our art gallery or our art exhibition, you know, some people will value good lighting and a place to sit. Other people will value how the artwork is grouped. Oh, should we group the artwork by uh, medium or year or maybe subject matter? I've been in an art gallery that, or museum that did it by subject matter and it was really cool. Um, so who are you hoping to attract? And do you know where your product stands? Are you, maybe you're a utility that everybody, your, your customers all just need it and they're willing to put up with some trouble because they just need your product. Uh, and other times it needs to be perfect or people are just gonna like that. This, this app is too slow, I'm going somewhere else. So you have to understand your customers. How do you understand where your team is at or your organization if you have a lot of teams, bigger organizations? Where do you stand right now in terms of your quality practices, your ability to consistently deliver high quality features to customers? So um, Janet Gregory and Selena Delisi came up with this quality practices assessment model. There's a book on LeanPub about it. And I was able to use this last year for a client. They had seven, uh, seven different teams and it was a company that had grown by acquisition. So every one of these teams had completely different process. Some of them had testers, some didn't. Uh, and so they just, they knew they wanted a whole team approach to quality. The, the leadership was promoting that, but the teams just didn't know what that meant. And they just didn't know where to start. And so I suggested, let's, let's do a quality practices assessment. And so I was able to um, 
do process retrospectives and interview people and get an idea of these in the book, uh, they present 10 quality aspects that that they feel are the most important ones. And <clears throat> I was able to tell them as an organization where they stood in each one of these quality practices. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the agile fluency model from Diana Larson and James Shore, but it's it's designed like that. You don't have to be the highest level of competency in every aspect because they're not all as important to you in your context. But which ones are important to you? We know we can't fix everything all at once. We have to focus. So getting a baseline of where you are now and then deciding which is the most important quality aspect to work on next to get to the next level there is so important and it really simplifies things. So I, uh, I highly recommend this idea of just measuring where you are in quality practices. And Janet and Selena are working on a book on how to conduct the quality assessment using their model. So look for that on LeanPub too. Um, but I just think it's a great thing to, to do. And it's a bit of effort. You come up with kind of a quality radar at the end, but it's, it's such a good foundation. And then you can keep evaluating over time to see if you are moving towards your goals. So like so many things in agile software development, culture is really important. A lot of teams or organizations I've run into where they transform to agile. It's like, oh, now we're going to go fast. And the truth is, when you first implement agile, as I'm sure a lot of you know, you're going to go slower because you have to learn a lot of new stuff. If you focus on speed, you're just going to accumulate a lot of technical debt. You're going to cut corners, you're going to postpone automating tests, you're, oh, we don't have time now to learn how to do continuous integration or test driven development or whatever it is. So we're not going to pair a program that would be inefficient. And, and you're just going to slow down over time because you're going to be get code you're afraid to touch and that takes forever to change because you don't have automated regression tests. And ugh. when you focus on quality, and you build those good core practices that you know will move you to your quality goals. It's going to take more time. It's an investment, but you build that solid foundation. And also, you learn the business domain so you can really help your business stakeholders pare down to the minimum things they need to satisfy customers. Uh, and so build it in the most efficient way that you can. And that solid foundation does let you go faster later on, partly because you're able to cut out a lot of stuff the business thought they wanted, but when they think about it, customers don't really want it, don't need it. So talk about quality with the team, ask the good questions. What's the value of this feature? I can't tell you how many times I've asked a product owner, okay, when we release this feature to customers, how will you know it was successful? And they go, oh, I don't know. Well, why are you doing this? You don't even know. Uh, we got to ask those questions. What quality attributes are the most important? Is security more important or performance more important? You know, uh, compliance. What's our compliance department going to say? Um, so to achieve our quality goals, we need to experiment. We need to innovate. Um, it has to be okay to ask questions. We need that psychological safety, as as I'm sure you know, is a prerequisite to success with Agile. I love the uh, modern agile model from Josh Karieski. Each person has to feel valued and they feel empowered to contribute. So we use our strengths to help each other and then we can be successful. So shift our focus from think to thinking about testing first to bug prevention, to thinking about our product at a system level. I've worked on really big applications where our team had this part of it, like maybe we had the web UI that was great but if some engine behind that is terrible and the customers experience poor performance or something like that they're going to think our product is terrible we really have to think about what do the customers see and this is something our business stakeholders and customer support and people can help us with so just get your whole team together and have those conversations that's one of my donkeys marcella um, I have to get one gratuitous donkey picture into every slide deck. How can we get everybody engaged? How can we build those relationships with people like operations uh, that can help us with the compliance team, with whoever it is? Um, you know, let, and what level do we want to achieve 
we need to make a commitment because it's going to be very difficult. We're going to run into a lot of obstacles and have to figure out how to get around them. So needs that strong, strong commitment. Janet and I have conveniently written a mini book about the holistic testing model because we had a lot of blog posts and realized, well, how are people going to know to go to all these blog posts? So this turned out to be, of course, a much bigger effort <laughs> than we thought, but we're really happy with this book. Uh, just to explain how to use the holistic testing model. And you can download it for free on agiletestingfellow.com. You don't even have to give us your email. Just scroll down a little bit. You'll see a download button for the PDF. Um, and we're getting really good feedback. People are finding it helpful to, to understand that holistic approach. So just some resources for further learning. Our, our book website, our training company website, our individual websites. We also have a YouTube channel, um, Agile Testing Fellow YouTube channel, where we have our Donkeys and Dragons video chats that are 50 minutes long and often have a have a guest. I don't know why it's jumping off that page. Um, and, and our books. So, um, and reach out to me anytime on Twitter, LinkedIn, Lisa at LisaChrisman.com email. I'm always happy to answer questions. And so, Hopefully people have more questions now. I will stop sharing. I've got a question maybe to get things started, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So other people, other people get, your, get your questions on the chat. So I'm really interested in TDD and it's something I've been in teams that are TDD and as an engineer, I've been a, 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 in a TDD environment. And I recently found some studies that suggested that it wasn't the tests themselves that, that were responsible for TDD being, TDD being successful. It was more that it's encouraging people those shorter feedback um, mm -hmm. cycles. And when I looked into more of this, oh, it got into a bit of a hotbed of debate on this side and that side over on LinkedIn everywhere. And I was just wondering what your thoughts are on that, being a much more experienced, cleverer person in that field than I am. Well, it's definitely a code design activity, not, not so much a testing activity, though it has that benefit of the safety net of automated regression tests. But I think it kind of comes down to this, you know, the understanding what you're going to build. I know like for acceptance test driven development, um, I've worked on teams that did that. And we realized later, it, it was great to have those regression tests after we were done. But the important thing was to design the tests, we had to talk. And so if I specified a test and a developer had written the production code and then the test failed, now the developer says, well, that's not how it's supposed to work. And I'm like, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> we better get the product owner. And so we all agreed that what was important was we got that shared understanding up front. And, that, and like you say, that quick feedback. Um, and it, it's just more of a collaboration tool in a way. I think that's right, but the, the, and it's you know it's I've been on three different teams that learned it from scratch, and it all it took at least eight months just to get traction on it, and that was with training and plenty of time to learn and no pressure from the management. It's like take as long as you need. You don't have to be delivering a lot of features right now. We care about you learning to do this well. Uh, it, 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 Brian Merritt calls it the hump of pain, because when you first start and you don't know how to do it, it takes it takes longer. Now everything you do takes longer and eventually you get the knowledge and you also get the library of components you can reuse and all of a sudden you're saving the effort. Um, but most people are not patient and most, most business management is not patient enough to let teams take that time to learn. It's my experience. But when they do, every developer I've worked with that did learn TDD would never go back or and ever do it any other way. And it's not perfect for everything. Nothing's perfect for everything. So. Am I supposed to? Brilliant. Okay. Hand. Yeah, we've got a question from Barnaby. Take it away, Barnaby. Well, first of all, thanks for the talk. That was really interesting. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about kind of testing dependencies between teams. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing a lot now with these kind of microservice architectures that it's hard to do all the testing in one team. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder what your thoughts were on how you kind of coordinate between teams on the testing side and the quality side. Yeah, what I've done is just reach out to the testers on those other teams. And um, like at my last job, that was a big, that was a big problem. Um, the teams weren't talking to each other and, you know, 
things were going like this. So we testers got together and we had a Slack channel. I mean, anybody could join our Slack channel, but it's like talking about testing for these different components of the product. And then we, we organize a weekly exploratory test session where we spend an hour doing exploratory testing on the whole thing or whatever was ready from the whole thing. And what we discovered was, as we talk, we realized, uh oh, my team is doing this and it's going to conflict with what the other team is doing. We need to get these people together to talk more, more than just us. And that was super helpful. And depending on your type of application, I have not personally worked on microservices applications, uh, but our last video chat that I did with Janet, we had um, Lewis Prescott as our guest, and he talked about using contract testing at the API level to test microservices and how that had benefited his teams. So that's, you know, some of these approaches are kind of technological, you have technological solutions, but I think a lot of it is just about building those relationships and making people talk. And I find that testers are kind of the butterflies. I've had, and I've been in situations where I had to support more than one team. That's fairly, sadly, fairly common. It's kind of bad because task switching is bad. But on the other hand, I was like, oh, this team is is uh, upgrading this page in our UI to the to React. And this other team is making functional changes to that page before it's changed to React. And they're going to collide. And so I guess I get the get the product owners or the lead developers or whoever talking to each other because I knew about that. So just whatever we can do to facilitate that collaboration amongst the teams is helpful. The other thing I, we found super, super helpful, and, and I've done this at my last couple jobs, is uh, have ensemble testing sessions. So if we've got a new feature that's ready to go to beta or whatever, um, and whoever was the lead tester on that would organize an ensemble testing session and anybody in the whole development organization was welcome. So of course, at first, nobody knew what we were doing. It's like exploratory testing, ensemble testing, what's that? Um, but we get a few, we get the testers and we get a few developers from different teams. And in half an hour, we would have found so many issues that were previously undetected because we had all these people looking at it with fresh eyes. And they saw the benefit of that right away. And it really caught on. And everybody's like, hey, can I have an ensemble testing session for my feature? Uh, and that that helped also to build relationships amongst the teams because we had developers from different teams participating so that they could see other parts of the of the product. So that's something I highly recommend as well. You have to facilitate those pretty carefully at first. And you know, if you maybe do uh, explore testing, testing charters or have some kind of plan for how you're going to conduct it to make it productive and you don't want to spend too long. Test parties. Some people call them test parties. I love that. I want a test party now. <laughs> um, earlier on in the chat, really at the beginning, Sheena was asking about testing in a regulated environment. And maybe Sheena might ask us a little bit more in depth about it. But, you know, what are your thoughts about testing in a regulated space? I mean, for me, testing is testing and quality is quality. So it shouldn't really matter in the world. But what's your thoughts? Well, I have worked in a regulated environment, financial services. And um, what we found that was really important was to talk to our auditors <laughs> because we were using different practices than they were used to. And but, you know, they're people, they're humans. We can talk to them. And so, for example, they had all kinds of requirements for documentation and traceability and things like that. And we could show them the output from our continuous integration with our test results and our tests. We use test frameworks that allowed us to make the tests readable by human beings that couldn't code. And so they could actually look at the test and see what each test is doing and and see the results that actually passed. Um, and we showed them how we correlated it back to the original user story. And they were completely happy with that. They didn't need a big test plan. They didn't need some big heavyweight document. So I think collaborating with your auditors is really important. Or if you have an in-house compliance department, just getting those people involved. I, um, I've talked to a lot of people that work on medical devices and, and things like that. And they've all told me this is, the, this is the approach to take. Just build that relationship and work together with the people involved in enforcing those compliance requirements. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot from you. Communication, make everyone your best friend, buy mm -hmm. everyone pizza. That's what I'm hearing anyway. <laughs> pizza or donuts, always welcome. Yes, uh, obligatory definitely. For the odd pizza. I haven't figured out how to do food in the remote world. 
No, uh, <laughs> short of sending everybody a pizza, but that'd be pretty expensive. Yeah. <laughs> what other questions have we got for Lisa? Get her while you can. Sebastian, take it away. Yeah, uh, regarding the construct, uh, sorry, I need to lower my hand. Uh, regarding building building a culture, uh, I'm trying to help other people in, in other in other in other things. You know, uh, where we are working, we are having one tester embedded in each team. So I'm trying to help people with increasing cooperation with other developers, like they show me with something that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find it safe. You could have, uh, I could, we could have any more pointers because it's something I do, but they, it's kind of a, I've been lucky enough that I've been in a team with the same, de with a core of same developer for years. Mm -hmm. So I'm at the point where someone is telling me, you know, okay, here's the story. I already tested it. And I'm like, okay, sit with me 10 minutes, show me. And then I mm -hmm. could be like, okay, you know, it's more line enough or, okay, let's do this other thing. But I feel like it's hard to give advice, but it's a thing I've been doing for a while with the same people. It's like with people who are new teams, it's like how I how I help them to create this, you know, so they can build their own relationship. They can have their own, mm -hmm. oh, you told me you tested it. You know, sit with me and show me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great, it's, and it's a kind of a low risk way to do it. It's not frightening to people like, oh, it's just going to spend 10 minutes and, and uh, let's do it together. And of course, my preference is to do is to pair or or do my programming or ensemble programming. Mm -hmm. And I've been lucky to work on teams doing that and seeing the value of it. But that could be a hard sell to managers like, what? What are you doing? But if it's just like, hey, we're gonna spend 10 minutes doing this, who can who can complain about that? And it and it, it's a big help. Mm -hmm. uh, so sorry, second one, because one thing you said uh it's important, you know. A speed, uh, decreasing the speed of release, you know, the resisting the resisting the calls of the of the of the squirrel of ship it, and try to with more quality. But how do you balance that when you find an history, a history, a stories that have a hard deadline? Like for example, in regulated fields, it's like you have to implement this legislation that is going to start this day. Um, mm -hmm. That's the days you guys have. No more. Well, if you're doing less, better, but no more for sure. That's a tough one in terms of things like a, a regulatory issue, right? Be like uh, GDPR is going to start on this date. I've been through that oh, one. I was in that one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's hard with those. I mean, a lot of business deadlines are like, oh, we want to show this feature at our next, you know, uh, user conference or our next industry conference. So show it off. Those kind of things you can just say, okay, what's the most important to you? Because you're going to have to take some of these feature requirements off. And, you know, when they're faced with, do you want 80% of what you wanted already and working on time? Or do you want 100% of what you wanted, but it's not ready to go? Mm -hmm. um, with, I think with regula regulatory things, it's, it's a lot harder. And I think it's just a question of brainstorming what you can do if the deadline can't be changed. Is there anything you can put off and do later? Um, sometimes bringing on more people helps. Sometimes bringing on more people slows it down. Um, so, yeah. and this is but this is the importance of using these thinking tools to think ahead. Because you might even start out thinking, "Well, yeah, that's doable." If you didn't really stop and get through, well, all, what are all the what are all the testing activities we would need to do? Um, you might be cut short on that. So, at least being conscious of what the problems are going to be and the risks are going to be, and to, and just to say. Okay, we can meet that deadline, but we're confidence level that everything's going to work is fifty percent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we know this thing could go wrong, but already, but at least we have a plan. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Over to you. Hello. Um, I posted this earlier in the chat, but um, are there any tips on how to fit all those quadrants into a sprint? Because I often find some of that doesn't really fit or trying to do performance testing and you get told we haven't got the right environment and, and all of that sort of stuff. So that can be quite a struggle sometimes. Well, it's a question of managing how much work you bring into your sprint. So a lot of teams bring in too much. Uh, and also sometimes as you're slicing your stories and they're still too big. So I've found that working, you know, making our stories tiny and all about the same size helps us manage our throughput a little better and we do need to make sure and again this is where the quadrants model and the holistic testing model can help we're going to need to do all this testing and so maybe writing the code isn't going to take that long but the testing is going to 
I've, I've worked, especially in regulated environments, the testing can take longer than the coding for sure. And so making sure you're thinking of all those things in your in your sprint planning. And it's like, well, that's not going to, we can't do all that in the sprint. So we're going to have to take out a story. Um, because again, if you put things off, like the performance testing, you're going to start accumulating test, technical debt. And you could have really unpleasant surprises later on. And now you have to do rework. Rework's the worst. You know, having to do something over again is going to kill your cycle time. So um, I think it's managing your planning, making things, delivering in smaller increments. Yep, thank you. I think that's one of the things as well as being as grand master is chugging those stories down to spawn enough. And um, yeah, thank you. Over to you, Lindsay, take it away. Thank you all. Um, I've recently come into an environment where there is a couple of QA people, um, which is not something I've been used to before. Um, and they, they do a great job, but I do feel that it's, I've gone back to a, a gated process and it's picking up on, picking up on something Fiona said uh, in the chat, uh, this recommended QA to dev ratio. Oh. They're, doing, they're doing a fantastic, no, no, no. They're doing a fantastic job, but I'm trying to, to see, to, to get them to see, you know, that, that I'd really like them in the teams and there aren't enough of them to be in the teams. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking for arguments to convince people. <laughs> Is there a, so are they on a separate team or are they, they embedded? They, they serve four teams between them. The teams are oh. very, very small. So they serve all four teams. Yeah. And they do a great job. Um, but I just feel that they, they shouldn't be out on their own. No, I mean, they just, I would first look at a way if you can, I don't know how many there are, but if they could just be one embedded on each team. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, th you know, the, the modern role of a tester that I see and that I've experienced is there's no way, even if we had 10 testers or every developer, maybe we could, but generally the testers cannot handle all the output of the developers if they're responsible for all the testing. So the whole team needs to be responsible for the testing, but the, everybody who's not a tester doesn't know how to do that testing. So having mm -hmm. a tester embedded on the team is really important because they also have to help people learn testing skills. And I'll give you an example. I was working on a team where we wanted to move to continuous delivery. And when we tried to, to deploy to production more than once every two weeks, <laughs> like twice a week, uh, all of a sudden, the testers, we were so involved in just getting the releases out the door, we didn't have time anymore for exploratory testing and horrible things happened in production. And our development managers were really savvy. And they said, exploratory testing is what we need. And obviously, two testers and 30 developers, that's not going to, we can't just have the testers do that. So everybody's going to learn the, the, uh, exploratory testing skills. And they put exploratory testing exploratory testing skills into the skills matrix for the career development of developers. So if they wanted to advance to the next grade of developer, they had to have a certain set of exploratory testing skills. And then they told us testers, okay, have some workshops, teach people exploratory testing, start pairing with developers and so that you can do exploratory testing along with them and help them understand it. And, we, and eventually when they knew how to do it, the developers working on a story were responsible for the exploratory testing at the story level. And we gave them a little, you know, a, another developer and I made a little cheat sheet of here's some heuristics to go through on your story. And um, because the development managers prioritized it, then the developers were motivated to do it. And the, we testers were there to help them learn. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Adrian, last question, the floor is yours. Oh, the stress. Hi, Adrian. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Lisa. Um, a challenge I sometimes hit with like, trying to bring testing throughout the entire process is that some teams seem to get very comfortable and, and confident with certain kinds of quality testing work and kind of ignore the rest and kind of don't <laughs> want to look at it. So, you know, there's awesome TDD and great exploratory testing mm -hmm. and the load testing is fantastic, but it doesn't really matter because there's like eight users and the internationalization and content design sucks uh, <laughs> and, the use, and the usability is pretty poor. Uh, so that they've, they've kind of focused on the things that, that they really know how to do well and give nice clear results and kind of ignored the more fuzzy stuff that's a little bit distant from them. How do you approach challenges like that? Uh, 
Well, my brain just went off the rails a minute. Uh, can you distill that down to want to? What, what, How what do you get asking? people doing testing and quality stuff that they don't normally do and maybe don't oh. even see as quality testing things? I think it goes back to having that conversation about what does quality mean to us? So, for example, I was on a team back in the day. New Scrum team had been a really dysfunctional waterfall organization. And we got to, our manager told us to get together. What does quality mean to you? And for us, we decided our quality meant to us that we would had we would write code that was so good, we take it home and show our moms and put it on our, our refrigerators. That was our goal. Okay, well, what will get us to that goal? Well, hmm, the extreme programming practices seem to be proven, this is back in 2003, but the extreme programming practices seem to be a way to build that kind of quality into your code. Test driven development, continuous integration, refactoring, pair programming, blah, blah, blah. And we made a commitment. We're going to achieve this level of quality. So now we have to make a commitment to learn those practices. And again, we were fortunate to have a good manager and good leadership. They were like, yes, it's important that you learn these things. Take your time and learn them. And here's some training support to help you. And, and that's how we did it. And I think it always comes back. The team has to decide together that they want that quality and they're committed because it's hard. There you go. Look at Adrian's happy little face with that answer. And I would just I'd just throw out there, those of you facing a lot of challenges, because there are a lot of challenges around this. Uh, one thing that has helped me over the years are Linda Rising and Mary Lynn Mann's books, Fearless Change and More Fearless Change, that have patterns to help you be an influencer and instigate change and get allies. You know, get allies. There's there are people in your organization who will always be haters, but there are people in your organization that think like you do. So find an ally and start building up support for some new change. So <laughs> yes, do food Brilliant. is definitely one of my favorite patterns. <laughs> okay, well, what a night. So many great questions. I can imagine we could have probably gone on for the next two hours, but we- Well, feel free to reach out today. to me too. Like I say, on Twitter, LinkedIn, email, whatever. I'm always happy to, and you can go to my website and book a 30-minute a, a chat with me too. So feel free to do that. I'm always happy to talk testing.